Hello, everyone. Welcome back to your anatomy lecture. Today, we are going to be taking a look at the abdomen, which is mostly going to include the digestive system. But there's also other stuff, such as the urinary system, and then a little bit of other stuff as well. Like there's going to be the spleen, the pancreas, and just a few more niche things. But all of those are pretty important, although organized a lot more differently from what we're kind of like used to. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to be taking a look at the abdomen, which is generally going to be like including a lot of these different like digestive organs, but then also the pancreas, the spleen, the kidneys, and so on. So oops, didn't mean to move that. But let's go ahead and get started by taking a look at what's kind of like covering everything. So hopefully this kind of sounds familiar at this point, but just like the pleural membranes, just as the pericardial membranes, the abdomen in this case is going to have peritoneum. So just like those other membranes, these are going to be a double layer where you have a layer that's going to be directly on the organ that in this case is called the visceral peritoneum. And then there's going to be a layer along like the abdominal wall in this case, which is called the parietal peritoneum. And if you look closely, there's a space inside as usual, which is in this case, the peritoneal cavity or peritoneal space. So basically, I mean, just like everything else, you have these two linings to help with keeping everything protected. These don't move quite as much as the lung as well as the heart, but this is also going to play a role in keeping everything to some extent in place. Like you might be familiar with that you have like a lot of these tubes inside of your like abdomen, inside of your, I mean, your lower trunk region. And a lot of it will move around, but you do want it to kind of stay in place. It's not just like snaking around randomly. It is going to be held to some extent anchored to the back of the abdominal wall. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we have here, where we also have a division like within the abdominal wall, including the intra as well as extra or retro peritoneal organs. So intra peritoneal organs mean that they are inside of the peritoneum. So if you look closely, those are all missing. Like those would have been all of the organs inside of the peritoneum, like the ones that is covered by all of these membranes. So these are all intraperitoneal, meaning that they're surrounded by that very typical like double layer of peritoneum. But when we say the word extraperitoneal, or retroperitoneal more specifically, that means that they are behind the peritoneal wall. So this is a little bit of an interesting case where you have the abdomen, which is going to have that double membrane, but then you will also have some organs that will be behind that curtain of peritoneum. So you can see that there are some of the organs that are basically kind of just like held behind that wall of connective tissue which are now going to be called retroperitoneal being behind it. So you can see a couple of them, such as like the kidneys, as well as part of the small intestine, the pancreas, and then although missing, you would have the ascending and descending colon here as well. So some of them are, as you'd probably expect, lined with that visceral peritoneum and then have the parietal peritoneum around it. But in this case, the parietal peritoneum is right here covering these organs, helping to hold them in place, and cover them along the back of the abdominal wall. Now, when we look at the peritoneum, it's a little bit different from what we usually expect. Like, we usually kind of like imagine it being a very succinct covering of the organs, and then also along the abdominal, or along that like cavity wall. But in this case, a lot of these organs actually hang down as well, which gives us some different types of structures. So one of which I would like to introduce first called mesentery is basically kind of like a region that allows the organ to hang down further. Like this is going to be a anchoring point made up of a double layer of peritoneum, which holds it, it, holds it connected to the abdominal wall but then it also does allow it to have some range of motion as well. 
So if you look closely, well, you can see a little bit of it here. There is the peritoneum that is hanging down from here. This is going to be like one of your parts of your peritoneal folds. And if you look closely, maybe here a little bit better, like you can see that there are parts that hang down from the back wall. They hold it in place, but then they also do allow it to kind of like move around a bit. So those in this case are called mesentery, or for the small intestine, it'll be called mesentery proper. But then you also do have a part that connects to like the colon specifically, the large intestine specifically, which is called the mesocolon. So it makes sense because colon is large intestine and mesocolon is the mesentery of the colon. But you also do have a couple of more specialized peritoneal folds which are called omentum. And in this case, you have a greater and lesser omentum. So the greater omentum is the part that hangs down from the greater curvature of the stomach. It kind of like hangs down from here and then it goes all the way down along the front of the abdomen right here. So you probably should have left that picture. If you look closely, there's this kind of curtain that hangs over the majority of the intestines this is the greater omentum, which is largely going to be fat. So the greater omentum is kind of like right along the anterior side of the abdomen underneath the abdominal wall. And you can see it kind of covering a little bit of, or a lot of the intestines kind of behind it. But if you look closely, there's also the liver and the stomach here with a lesser omentum, which is going to be between the liver and the stomach instead. Now with those, you do have some specific ligaments, but to be honest, they're pretty, uh, they're not as easy to find, but you have the gastrocolic ligament, the gastrosplenic ligament, and then also the hepatogastric ligament and the hepatoduodenal ligament. So in those cases, like gastrocolic is referring to like something that connects the stomach and then also the intestines. Gastrosplenic means stomach and spleen. Hepatogastric means liver and stomach, and then hepatoduodenal means liver and small intestines or liver and duodenum specifically. So those are not very easy to see, especially in these pictures. So don't worry too much about them. But the greater momentum and the lesser momentum are things that you can definitely find and you can definitely at least know about for the future. But to keep on going, Taking a look at the abdomen, you can see that it's actually a pretty wide spot. And just to be clear, like regarding when we talk about the abdomen, like we just talked about the thorax recently, that is stopping or ending right at the thorax, or sorry, right at the diaphragm. And right after the diaphragm, you'll have the abdomen start going all the way down to basically like the pelvis. So sometimes the abdomen kind of like gets mixed up with the pelvis a little bit. But at the very least, the abdomen has a very distinct separation between the thorax and then itself at the diaphragm. So make sure that you kind of understand where the abdomen starts because that will be helpful for naming certain things as well. Now, when you look at the abdomen, we do have some kind of divisions within it. And when you look at these, you'll be able to kind of like recall that there are certain things in certain regions because when we talk about the abdomen, it's not as well symmetrical as everything we've talked about so far. Like there's a lot of differences between the left and right sides, whether it's like starting points of the intestines, ending points, as well as organs that are solely on one side. So this division and this separation into these regions are a little bit more important for the abdomen. So mostly though, it is gonna be divided into right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant. So basically dividing it up in four, there is largely four spots, but then you also have the periumbilical peri region, which is near the umbilical region, which is like the belly button. So you can see that depending on which quadrant you're in, it's going to, be pretty variable in what you find, like some of the upper quadrants have some things that the lower quadrants have. 
And then some things will be maybe solely in the upper left quadrant or something of the like. So when we divide this up, like you can see that depending on where you are, which corner for the most part, you'll see that organs will largely be in one place or the other, and then maybe have good starting or ending points that'll be good to kind of take note of as well. Now to start taking a look at these organs, I mean, we are basically talking about the gastrointestinal tract, and that is otherwise known as the GI tract. I'm sure you've at least heard of that term before, but just to be clear, when we talk about the gastrointestinal tract, that's referring to this long tract that starts at your oral cavity, and then it goes all the way through your body as one singular long tube to go to the anus. So it's kind of one big long tube, which travels all the way through the body. So in a way, some people will consider things in the GI tract, not technically in the body. Like it's not until you absorb it through your tissues into your blood where we consider it in the body, because when it's going through the gastrointestinal tract, it's kind of technically outside still. Like it's not been absorbed or brought into any tissues. It's just potentially traveling through this open space inside the body. And just to give you kind of another weird analogy for this, it's kind of like a donut. Like imagine like going through a donut or putting something through a donut hole. Like that's kind of what the GI tract is for us. So uh, take that for what it is, but yeah, it's a long tube basically. So we're just gonna go from tube to tube to tube to tube to tube. And we're gonna see that there will be distinct parts and distinct organs along the way, but it's still a long open space throughout the body. So to start off with, you have the esophagus, and the esophagus starts kind of anterior to the, or sorry, posterior to the larynx, right at the bottom of the pharynx. So right at the bottom of the pharynx, right behind the larynx, that's where the esophagus is going to start, and then it's going to travel down through the thorax. As you can see, that is basically this muscular tube in the back traveling behind the trachea, and then going down through the diaphragm to then connect to the stomach right down here. So the esophagus is basically a muscular tube. And then just to also talk about one more thing, like the whole GI tract mostly has this particular type of contraction, which is called peristalsis. And this is one of the places where you'll see this happening first, which is that it's a kind of coordinated contraction where if you look at a long tube, it's basically going to contract in sequence. So when you contract or when you have peristalsis, you'll have the first part or top part contract. That is going to squeeze whatever is in here downward. And then from here, the next part will start to contract and the previous will relax. And it will continue to do that, to squeeze it down in sequence, to push it in a unidirectional manner. Like there will be times when you want the food or the kind technically to go kind of back and forth for a little bit more time within the space. But if you want to move something forward, you have peristalsis that will help to do that. And throughout this tube, this is, I mean, you're going to have it basically all the way from like the esophagus down to the rectum. But looking at the esophagus, you can see that it's going to be this tube that travels through the thorax to lead to the stomach. And then although not shown here, there is something called the lower esophageal sphincter or the gastroesophageal sphincter because it's right between the stomach and the esophagus, which is going to help with preventing acid reflux. So basically, this is going to close at the top of the stomach so that acid does not go back up into the esophagus. And then something else that I want you to kind of think about is if this does not happen, what do you think that's going to feel like? So look closely at where we're at right here. You have the esophagus and the stomach right underneath the diaphragm, which is going to be right over here or so. So if you have acid going back into the esophagus, you'll feel a bit of a burning sensation. And what else do you have here in this region? Your heart. So. Like, just to be clear, when you say the words heartburn, 
you're not actually talking about your heart. You're talking about your esophagus and acid reflux. So if the gastroesophageal sphincter does not work effectively in like closing that area, or if there's just maybe too much acid, or if it's overfilled or something of the like, then you'll feel a burning sensation in your region behind or under your heart, basically. So definitely not your heart, but it is a digestive thing in this case. Now that leads us down to the stomach, which if you look closely, where is your stomach? So when you say you have a stomach ache, a lot of people kind of grab their lower like abdomen region, but look at what's there. That's actually intestines. So that's not your stomach. Your stomach is all the way up here, kind of in the upper left region of your abdomen. So right underneath the diaphragm, in fact, that's going to be where your stomach will be on the upper left quadrant. And then it does extend a little bit into the upper right quadrant as well. And the stomach is basically just like a muscular sac, which is going to be able to secrete substances such as pepsinogen and pepsin, and then also hydrochloric acid, which is going to help with further breaking down the food, specifically for the most part, proteins. But basically, the stomach is a kind of sac or a chamber that is going to be made up of muscles, allowing it to squeeze certain parts, mix and churn to allow for that additional chemical digestion, as well as the physical di digestion as well. But just to be clear, a lot of your physical or what's the word? Mechanical digestion happens in your mouth. But your stomach does do some of that as well because you don't always chew everything the smallest, but I mean, your stomach will mostly use chemical digestion, but also do some physical mechanical digestion too. So the stomach is up here in the upper left region, but the stomach also does have some of its own anatomy as well. So if you take a look at it, it has some major regions, starting off with the top region called the fundus. And then if you look closely, there is the major body part or the, the major part, which is called the body right over here. And then a kind of smaller region right underneath the esophagus, this opening is called the cardia. So all of these are kind of like very close together, but then you have this one part that's very distinct, which is where the stomach starts to curve. So the stomach is actually kind of like a J shape where you can see the stomach curving, and this narrowing region is called the pylorus. And the pylorus technically does have a few more specific parts. The antrum is the main part where everything kind of goes into, and then you have the canal when it starts to narrow, and then the pyloric sphincter, like if you know what a sphincter is, it's a circular muscle that is going to be able to close when it contracts and open when it relaxes. And this is how you'll control the flow of chyme in this case, like sludgy digested material going from the stomach to the small intestines. Now that leads us to the small intestines now. Well, actually, sorry, before we get to the small intestines, we have to look inside the stomach. So looking at the stomach, there is a little bit of anatomy to its layers. So the layers of the stomach will be important for its function because number one, like if you look at the inside, it's gonna be very wrinkly. So it's wrinkly because there are these folds called rugae, which are going to allow it to scrunch up when it's folded, but then when it stretches out, it can expand. So the stomach is going to be made up of, or it's gonna be lined by rugae, but the innermost lining of the stomach will also have its own type of anatomy to it itself, which is going to be mostly columnar epithelium, which is going to also have secretory cells, such as chief cells, parietal cells, and then goblet cells that make those materials, hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, which helps with digesting, or which is an enzyme that helps with digesting proteins, and then goblet cells help to make mucus, which is really important for making sure that your stomach doesn't digest itself. But the submucosa will be directly along the outside of that. 
that's basically supportive tissue. And then there's a muscular tissue, muscularis externa, which is going to have a few different layers. So you have a layer that's going to have longitudinal fibers. You'll have a layer that has circular fibers. And then you'll have a layer that has oblique fibers. And these layers are going to be allowing them to contract and squeeze in different directions. So the stomach, once again, like helps to churn as well as mix the substances within the stomach to allow it to digest more, but also to crush it to some extent and break it down a little bit more physically too. But lastly, although not shown on this picture, you should be able to see a very thin layer along the outside. That's called the serosa. And the serosa is basically the same as the visceral peritoneum. So the layer that surrounds the stomach is the outermost layer that forms the stomach. Now, moving down into the small intestines, we can see that you've got a big kind of section of the small, or if you have a big section of the abdomen that's kind of related to the small intestine. And this is basically a really long tube, which is about 22 feet long or about five meters, which can range from three to 8.5 meters, depending on the person. So this is going to be the big important part of the small or important part of the digestive system, which is going to allow you to actually absorb the nutrients which you digested. So just to be clear, when you broke down that food, you did not really get anything from it yet. Like you just broke it down. You may have tasted it. That might have been nice, but it's not until it gets to the small intestine, which allows you to actually absorb the nutrients. So breaking down stuff with your teeth, breaking down stuff with your saliva and amylase, breaking stuff down with your stomach. All of that was to make sure that the contents of what you ate gets small enough so that you can absorb it through the tissue walls into your bloodstream. But you don't get anything from you, from these foods that you eat until you absorb it into your blood through your small intestines, basically. So just to kind of describe the small intestines, it's a long tube. Although narrow, because it's the small intestine, it's actually quite large in total being, like, like you said, 22 feet or so. So in the small intestines, there actually will be a few parts to it, including the duodenum, the jejunum, and then the ileum. So when we look at this, it's basically all over the place, but let's go ahead and take a look at how we can divide up the small intestine. So the first part of the small intestine is directly after the pyloric sphincter. So notice, here is your stomach. This is your pyloric sphincter, that circular muscle. This is going to be the start of your small intestines, which we start off with a very small, succinct region called the duodenum. So the duodenum is going to be actually very important for continuing the digestion. And so far, we've had a lot of mechanical digestion, but for chemical digestion, we had a little bit of amylase, which breaks down starch. We had, a, we had pepsin and hydrochloric acid, which breaks down protein. But the duodenum has the secretions of the liver, which has bile, and then the pancreatic juices, which is going to have enzymes that break down fats, proteins, and starches. So this is where all the secretions are going to go from the liver at the common bile duct, the pancreas at the pancreatic duct, those are going into the liver. So these are going to be a continuation of chemical digestion where you have a lot of secretions and some amount of mechanical digestion as well. But it is a pretty distinct shape being just kind of like a C shape, but it does have a few regions to it too which is basically the superior part, the inferior part, the descending part where it's going down this way. And then it does have a small ascending part going upwards, which is that hook part of the C. So 
right after that ascending part though, this is where you'll have a very sharp turn where you'll have the jejunum start. Now, although not shown here though, there is something I do want to bring up, which is that the duodenum is going to be partially intraperitoneal up here, and then partially retroperitoneal down here. So when you look at the duodenum, especially in the cadaver lab, you'll see that part of the duodenum will be visible, but then it dives back into the retroperitoneal space, which is where it will then curve and continue to go along the descending horizontal and ascending part. But once you get to this duodenal jejunal flexure, flexure, sorry, this is where the jejunum becomes intraperitoneal again. So now that we have gone, or now that we have gone along the duodenum, we now come back into the peritoneal space. Intraperitoneal, the ju jejunum is going to be basically very visible as you look inside the abdomen. Now, this is where we'll see our last two parts, actually, the jejunum and the ilium. And I know the duodenum was only that C-shape. The rest of it is all this. So jejunum and ilium are going to be the rest of the small intestine. The jejunum is going to be about two-fifths, and the ilium is the th rest of the three-fifths of the major length of this region. So these are very long, but that's very important because this is where digest or not digestion, is an absorption of nutrients is mostly going to occur. So the jejunum especially is going to be really important for absorption of nutrients, and it will also have variations in its layers that's going to be really helpful for that to happen as well. So when we look at the jejunum and the ilium, its layers will be a little bit different from when we talked about the stomach. But to talk about their structure, first of all, if you look closely, the duodenum, well, actually, I guess you can't see the duodenum, but the duodenum is right here in this lined by this green right here. And then the jejunum is going to start right after this. So the jejunum is going to start right over here. As it comes out, this is going to be the jejunum starting near the upper left quadrant. So jejunum is going to start near the upper left quadrant, and that's mostly where you're going to find it. But just to be clear, we cannot really follow that, right? It's like it's just a mess. It's just a very convoluted tube, which we cannot really see where it's going. So when we talk about the jejunum, we will look for it in a very distinct spot in this upper left quadrant, and specifically where it becomes intraperitoneal or right after the duodenum. But the ilium, in the, uh, on the other hand, is the other half to this coin where you cannot see where the ilium starts, but we'll be able to find where the ilium ends. So the small intestine is going to continue to go along this long path until it reaches the lower right quadrant over here, where it's then going to end as it meets the large intestine. So the large intestine starts right down here at a structure called the cecum, and the ilium is gonna be located right down here. So I cannot tell you like where it's gonna be transitioning from jejunum to ilium. We need to either look at the inside of the intestines or look much more closely, but either way, I mean, we, if you're going to be able to identify it, usually you'll find it either near the duodenum or near the jejunum, or sorry, near the cecum. Now, looking at the intestinal wall, especially in the jejunum and then also ilium, you'll see that the intestines has a little bit of difference in its wall compared to the stomach. So for the intestines, their main purpose is absorption and the more contact you have with the nutrients and the intestinal wall, the better that is going to be able to occur. So in order to increase surface area inside of the intestines, that's where you have the mucosa being a little bit more specialized. So in this case, starting off with the big structures, actually, you have the plique circularis. So those are going to be these large folds of the small intestines which is basically, once again, kind of like 
crinkling up a piece of paper. And now you have a lot more ridges. You have a lot more here. You can crinkle up a piece of paper. Instead of being like really smooth, now it has to kind of go up and down all of these little crevices in order for it to be able to, I mean, travel through here. But the more contact with this intestinal wall, the more you're going to be able to absorb those nutrients from your digestive food. So the mucosa is going to have plique circularis, which are the big folds. But then now imagine that this piece of paper was lined by maybe like carpet or something like that. Something really bumpy with a lot of little things that are kind of sticking out from it. Those are called villi. So villi are going to be these little bumps. So you have like these big bumps and then you have these little bumps coming off of them. So imagine like my fingers being like little bumps off of this ridge. Those are the villi, which are going to be which are going to be lined with additional cells, which will then have microvilli on those cells as well. So the big ones are the plique circularis. Those are the big ridges. All along the plique circularis, there'll be little bumps called villi. And then each of the cells along the villi will then have microvilli as well. So you basically have bumps on bumps and then on bumps. So that just helps to increase surface area and hopefully allow you to absorb more nutrients. But next you have the submucosa. The submucosa is gonna be directly outside of the mucosa or under the mucosa being submucosa. And largely this is going to have blood vessels. So it does have lymphatic vessels, it does have connective tissue and nerves, but blood vessels are the thing that is going to be able to allow the nutrients to travel into. So when you absorb these nutrients, they don't just magically go to where they need to go. They need to travel through the blood first. So to do that, you have the blood vessels of the submucosa, which is going to allow the nutrients to travel through the, through the body, which we'll talk about, but it is going to allow the nutrients to be absorbed into the body basically. This is the point where you can actually start to absorb or say that it is now in your body. It has been absorbed into your tissues, into your blood, and it's not just in that long hollow tube going through your body. Now, when you look outside of that, just like the stomach, you do have a muscular, muscularis externa, but in this case, only two layers, which is going to be a longitudinal and then also a circular layer. So the circular layer is the part that allows for it to do the peristalsis. So pushing it down in a unidirectional manner, but then you also have longitudinal muscles that allow it to kind of like scrunch up and move things in a certain, in a different way. So I don't want to talk too much about it, but you do have different types of contractions, peristalsis being one of them, but you have like segmentation, which kind of like breaks stuff up and moves things around. So there's a lot of different things that your small intestine can do to also increase with more absorption of nutrients. But lastly, like the stomach, you do have the serosa, which is like your visceral peritoneum. Now, after the ileum, we can now lead into the large intestine, which is where you're going to have this bigger or rather wider tube starting right over here in the lower right quadrant. So the large intestine is in fact a lot shorter than the small intestine, it's just wider. It's kind of like a thicker tube basically. But luckily the large intestine is going to start at a very particular place and then it's gonna go along a very specific path as well. It's not as complicated as the small intestine, but there technically is like more parts. So the large intestine, just to be clear though, if we talked about absorbing nutrients, the large intestine is mostly for absorbing water and vitamins. But this is also where you're going to be able to form and well, as well as condense your fecal matter, which is going to ultimately end up at your rectum, which is right before you can expel it through your anus. So large intestine, you can see it starts right down here after the ileum. And then there's a certain piece right here called the ileocecal valve, 
which basically means that stuff that goes out of the ilium into the cecum does not go back in. Because now, now that we are in the large intestine, this is now basically waste. This is waste and fecal matter. So to take a look at the cecum, or sorry, the large intestine, we start down here at the cecum, which is in the lower right, lower right quadrant. And if you look closely, it has this little thing hanging off of it called the vermiform appendix. Now the appendix is something that a lot of people have heard of and in fact may have had experiences with because this is something that if it like gets messed up, you know it and actually can be a really big deal. So the appendix is known to be this little thing that doesn't have a huge function, but it is thought to have some amount of function in helping to maintain the microbial fauna of the large intestine. So basically it can like hold bacteria just in case, like if you were to expel everything, like you're going to be able to hold onto that and replenish your microbial fauna more quickly. But there is something else that can happen with the appendix, which is called appendicitis, which is inflammation of the appendix. And then that might require an appendectomy or the removal of the appendix. So just to be clear, like if you were to have this little thing start to become blocked or inflamed, or swollen, number one, it's gonna be really, really painful. But number two, it could burst. And if it bursts, it could actually expel materials from your large intestine into your abdominal cavity. And that's very, very bad because it's basically, it's fecal matter, it's waste, it's bacteria. That's not good to have in your abdomen in your open spaces. So. If you feel a very severe pain in your lower right quadrant, you need to go to the emergency room, like ASAP. So, I mean, yeah, please do that. But also that is a good reference point because the lower right quadrant is where we're starting. So when we look at this, we'll go from the lower right quadrant up the ascending colon at the, hepato the hepatic flexure. You'll go across the transverse colon at the splenic flexure. You'll go down the descending colon. And then as you see that it makes this like kind of curvy part, this is the sigmoid colon going towards the midline, which finally leads to this last part called the rectum, which is going to be the storage place for fecal matter where it will be able to condense so that it's more effective and more efficient to pass whenever necessary. But lastly, like along the bottom of the pelvic floor, that's where you'll have the anal canal surrounded by the anal sphincters, internal and external sphincters respectively. Now all along the large intestine, you do have some things that you can see here as well, which will include a smooth muscle, which is called the tenei coli, and if you look closely, you can see that you have this band of muscle that travels along the small or the large intestine. That would be the tenia coli. And then there's also these little pouches called hostra or hostrum for singular, which are right along like the large intestine as well. But then you do have this one more last thing, which is kind of an odd one, but you have these little pieces of fat hanging off the large intestine as well which are called epiploic appendages. So you can see in this picture, the tenia coli, the epiploic appendages, and then the little kind of pouch or sac-like structures along the entire large intestine, that's the hostra. Now, that's basically the large, or that's basically the gastrointestinal tract, starting from your oral cavity, going through your esophagus, down to your stomach, small intestines, large intestines, and then finally passing out or passing outward through the anal canal. But you do have a few things that will be also helping the digestive system to work effectively, which will be accessory organs to the GI tract. And the first of which is a very large one and a very well-known one called the liver. So the liver is really important. It's a big organ in the upper right quadrant, but this big organ is going to extend out into 
the upper left quadrant as well, but its main function is going to be number one, processing nutrients, but then number two, crew or detoxifying the blood. But then lastly, a really big one is helping to create bile. So the big functions of the liver are for the most part, processing nutrients, detoxifying the blood, and then also producing bile, which will help with digestion. So to explain, when you have the digestive system and the GI tract, that or all of that blood that has the absorbed nutrients does not actually go to your heart first. Like you'd think that these, all, all of this blood will just go back to your heart so that it could go out to the body. But in fact, that's not the best thing to do. Because if you do that, who knows what you took into your body? I mean, you might think you ate the right thing, but sometimes maybe that was not the right thing, or maybe you did that on purpose. But in this case, everything in your blood from your digestive system is largely going to go to the liver first. So the liver is going to help with processing everything, like all of the nutrients, but then also detoxifying things such as alcohol, which you may have ingested at some point. So the liver is going to be a pretty big organ up here, and it's going to have some parts that we need to know, including largely the lobes. So if you look closely, you mostly have left lobe and right lobe. Right lobe is the big one. But then when you look at the liver from the bottom, this right here in the bottom anterior region, this is called the quadrate lobe. And then the posterior bottom region, you have the caudate lobe. And then you also do have all of these things going in and out of the liver, which is called the porta hepatis, which is largely going to include the hepatic portal vein, but then also bile ducts and hepatic arteries. Now, some things that you can also relate to the liver. So if you recall, between the stomach and the liver, you have the lesser omentum. The lesser omentum is just kind of like a membrane and a fatty region between the lesser curvature and the stomach, or the lesser curvature of the stomach and the liver. But then you also have the falciform ligament and the round ligament, which is going to be right along the border between the left and right lobes. So the falciform lig ligament is going to be a lot more, a lot thinner, and it's kind of basically like a thin sheet, but at the bottom of the falciform ligament, you'll have the round ligament of the liver right down here, which connects to the abdominal wall, allowing it to help with anchoring the liver in place. But then along the superior posterior region, you also have this region called the coronary ligament, which is where you'll have a peritoneal fold, which helps with connecting the liver to the diaphragm. So if you recall, the diaphragm is basically kind of resting on top of the liver. So on the back, this is where you'll have a connection between the liver and the diaphragm as well. Now there's another organ that helps the liver to do its function, which is the gallbladder, which is basically a storage place for bile. So this is where you can store bile when you're not using it. So when you don't eat like a big fatty meal, the gallbladder can hold on to that bile for when you need it. So it's basically this little sac down here, which is then going to be able to secrete its substances down the bile ducts whenever necessary. But it itself does have a few parts as well. So you have the fundus, just like the stomach, the rounded part, kind of like a lot at the most extended region. You have the body, which is a large part. You have the infundibulum, which is just like a little kind of pocket. And then you have the neck, which leads to the cystic duct right here. And then talking about the ducts, I mean, you have ducts that come from the liver and the gallbladder. So to start off with, that neck of the gallbladder leads to the cystic duct, which is right here. And then looking at the liver, you have your left and right hepatic ducts joining to form your common hepatic duct right here. And then when your common hepatic duct and your cystic duct join together, you have the common bile duct where all of the bile is going to then converge to as it then goes to the ampulla of Vater or the hepatopancreatic ampulla 
of the duodna. So all the bile will go to the duodenum because this is where it's going to help with that fat digestion using the bile. Now, another organ that's also helpful for digestion, but not digestion as, oh, no, no. Yeah, it's very important for digestion, actually. The pancreas. So the pancreas is going to have two main functions, actually. One of which I don't talk about here, but you might know about. It's an endocrine gland which secretes insulin and glucagon, which is crucial for regulating your blood sugar. But then the pancreas is also a digestive organ, which is going to be secreting most of the enzymes that break down nutrients for everything. So it's going to break down fats using lipase. It's going to break down proteins using trypsinogen. And it's going to be breaking down carbohydrates using amylase. And then furthermore, it even also helps with neutralizing the hydrochloric acid coming into the intestines with bicarbonate. So a lot of stuff is going to be secreted by the pancreas, but that's, that's uh, a story for physiology. But pancreas, you can see right over here, kind of, it's right under and behind the stomach. So here you can see it a little bit better here. The stomach has been cut. The pancreas is right behind the stomach, but it's also secreting into the pink or into the duodenum using the pancreatic duct and just to be clear you have two pancreatic ducts you have one that's smaller up here and then one that's bigger right here that kind of combines with the common bile duct this is the main pancreatic duct and then this is the accessory pancreatic duct and then the pancreas does have some of its own regions including the tail the body the head and neck so there are some different regions of the pancreas, but not super important for it. But it definitely is an odd shape, which I know I don't or you don't like it when you bring up food in anatomy, but it kind of looks like a chicken tender. But yeah, that's the pancreas. You can see that it has like a narrow region, a larger region, which is like the body, the neck and the head. But this is going to be really important for not just digestion, but also your endocrine system as well. Now, the spleen is going to be your next organ that you have in the abdomen. This one actually isn't part of your digestive system. So the spleen is actually a lymphatic tissue. And in fact, it's a pretty important one because most of your lymphatic tissues filter something called lymph which is like extra, what's the word, extra cellular fluid, which is basically outside of the tissues, the spleen is actually going to be filtering your blood. So you can see a lot of blood vessels going in and out of here. And this is where you have kind of like a big filtering system for your blood in this case. So we have other filtering systems, such as the kidneys that will do that as well. But this is going to have like white blood cells, which help to trap things inside of here. So hopefully you'll be able to prevent like large scale infections. So the spleen will do a couple of things. Number one, it helps to filter your blood in that case, but also it does help with taking out or rather removing certain parts of red blood cells. But then another thing that the spleen does is that it's actually a very big reservoir for blood as well. So the spleen is actually a pretty dangerous organ to, to damage because if you do rupture the spleen, you're actually going to be hemorrhaging quite a lot of blood and it can be pretty bad. So, well, that's the spleen though. But just to talk about the spleen, where actually is it? It's in the upper left quadrant. You can see it right over here. It's right along the back and lateral side of the stomach, but it also has a region that touches the diaphragm, which is the diaphragmatic surface. It has the visceral surface, which is the opposite side. And then it has a hilum, which is where everything goes in and out, just like the lung. Now I think for our last major organs of the abdomen, we have the kidneys and the kidneys are your big urinary structures, meaning that this is where you filter your blood to produce urine. So to talk about the kidneys, 
They look like these big or rather small fist-sized kidney beans, and these are very distinctly retroperitoneal. Like these are along the back wall, and then they are going to be right along like the upper lateral portions of your abdomen. So when you look at this, notice that you have these big blood vessels connecting to them, but then you also have these tubes that lead down to the urinary bladder so that you can expel that urine as well. So I'm not gonna go into kidneys too much. Like I can, I can talk about kidneys for a long time. Kidneys are actually really, really important, but the kidneys are basically helping to filter your blood, but okay. I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit. So the kidneys, they filter your blood. They take things out. They make urine. But something that a lot of people don't think about is that it also helps with keeping the fluids inside as well. So the kidneys have a way of concentrating the urine as well because it's not like the same concentration. It's not always the same composition as what your blood is. It takes out certain things but then it also puts everything back in that you need to keep. And then furthermore, it has ways of concentrating that material using like a lot of osmotic gradients that basically like takes out water in a very specific manner. So just think about the different urines that you've had in your life. Have you had very clear urine? that's probably going to be very dilute urine because you drink a lot of water. But then if you have very yellow urine, that means that it kept most of the water, but then it got rid of the stuff that you didn't need. So that urine was very concentrated with stuff like urea, as well as potentially salts or even hydrogen ions. So yeah, the kidneys are pretty interesting, but I think I'll stop there. Sorry. but. Take a look at the kidneys. It does have some structure to them. It's not just a big kidney bean. There is some layers to it. So first of all, the very outermost layer, very, very thin layer, is the fibrous capsule. That's this outermost region right over here along the kidney. But then right underneath that, do you see this kind of lighter tissue? This is the outer layer called the renal cortex. So I probably should introduce renal is the word for kidney. So if you've ever heard of the word renal failure, hopefully not too often, but that means that the kidneys are in trouble. And in this case, renal is referring to the kidneys. So renal cortex is the outer layer. And you may have heard of this term when you talked about maybe the cerebrum because cerebral cortex is the outer layer of the brain. So renal cortex is the outer layer of the kidney, which is the lighter tissue but then you also have the renal medulla, which is the darker, more central tissue. Now there is a little bit more specificity to this though. So look closely and you can see that there are these regions between these dark parts, like the renal cortex kind of extends inwards. Those are called renal columns. And then individually, like there are these separations of the renal medulla, those separations are called renal pyramids. So I know it doesn't look like this. It looks more like a flower petal, but technically in three dimensions, it's going to be more pyramid shaped. So this is a renal pyramid, which is one section of the renal medulla basically. And then once again, I won't go into it, but there are differences in what you find in the renal cortex and medulla, and they have different functions that will allow them to do them. Now, when you make your urine in your renal cortex and renal medulla, that urine is then going to exit out of these little funnels at the bottom of each of those pyramids. So if you look closely, here's a renal pyramid. And then this singular funnel right here is called a minor calyx. So the minor calyx is this one funnel. But then if you look closely, those two minor calyces join together to form a bigger funnel right here. This is called a major calyx. And then when you have multiple major calyces joined together, this is now called the renal pelvis. So those are going to be the major regions which allow the urine to be collected in, or from the kidney, but then to go from the kidney down to the urinary bladder, 
you then have this region called the ureter. So that is going to be collecting urine, but inside the kidney, there's a couple more things to look for. Number one, just like the lung, you have the hilum of the kidney where the renal artery, renal vein, as well as the urinary structures, the renal pelvis will be traveling through. But then the renal pyramids have a little region at the bottom of them called the renal papilla. So papilla, kind of like papillary, are the little bumps. So that little bump is called the renal papilla. And then lastly, if you look closely, there are spaces between the minor calces. Those spaces are mostly filled with fats. But just like in the skull, those spaces are called sinuses. So leading down from the kidneys, you go down through the ur or through the abdomen, down the ureters, from the renal pelvis, down all the way into the pelvic region. And basically that's just how urine gets down to the to the bladder. But then you also do have one more organ down or up here, which is called the suprarenal glands, which is otherwise known as adrenal glands or adrenal glands. So this is going to be controlled by your sympathetic nervous system for the most part, but you also do have parts that will help with controlling the stress response as well. So your adrenal glands, it helps with the fight or flight response. It helps with the stress response, and it does also help with creating precursors to sex hormones as well. So, those are the major organs that we have in there, but you do also have blood vessels that we would like to look at as well. So to start off with, you have the abdominal aorta. So the abdominal aorta has a bunch of stuff coming off of it, and we'll go in order, but if you look closely, you have this first branch right underneath the diaphragm. This is called the celiac trunk, which has three major branches, which include the left gastric artery that goes up to the stomach, you have the splenic artery that goes out to the left to the spleen, and then you have one artery that goes to the right, which is the common hepatic artery. So you can see those here as well, left gastric artery going up along the lesser curvature of the stomach, splenic artery going behind the stomach to the spleen, and then common hepatic artery is gonna go to the right and then up to the liver. So the common hepatic artery is gonna be helping to supply the liver with oxygenated blood, but we will have some other blood vessels to look at as well. Now, continuing downward, you can see that you have the renal arteries, which go to the kidneys. Then you also have the gonadal arteries, which depending on the sex of the person will be called testicular or ovarian artery. So these are pretty small and sometimes hard to find and definitely hard to keep in a cadaver, but these are the gonadal arteries. Now, taking a look at the other unpaired blood vessels, I think I'm missing something, but if you look closely, there are two unpaired blood vessels here. You have the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. The superior mesenteric artery goes to supply blood to the right side of the abdomen, and then the left or the inferior mesenteric artery supplies blood to the left as well as the like deep rectal or pelvic region. So inferior mesenteric artery goes to the left as well as downward into the pelvis. So when you talk about things that are unpaired like celiac trunk, superior and inferior mesenteric artery, do not say left or right, like there's only one. Now, just to be clear though, we learned this before, but your abdominal aorta will then branch to common iliac arteries, and then your common iliac arteries branch to external and internal iliac arteries, which external will continue down to femoral artery. Now looking at the veins, you can follow the veins upwards now. Internal and external iliac veins, go to common iliac vein, and then your common iliac veins in this case make the inferior vena cava. And very similar to before, you have gonadal veins and renal veins, but the gonadal veins will be a little bit different than what we saw with the arteries. So the gonadal veins, which once again can be testicular or ovarian vein, have some asymmetry to them where the left gonadal vein drains into the left renal vein. So 
Okay, there we go. But the right gonadal vein drains into the inferior vena cava. So a little bit different between those two sides. So definitely be careful of that. Now, renal veins, as you'd expect, come from the kidneys and go straight into the inferior vena cava to go back to the heart. But lastly, we've got a pretty big part, but also kind of a tricky part, which is called the hepatic portal system. So if you look closely, the hepatic portal system is going to be relative to the liver. And this is going to be where you have a vein or a series of veins that go not to the heart, but to the liver. So the hepatic portal vein you'll see right here, which is then going to be going into the liver. And I, though I don't usually do this, let's work backwards. So here's the hepatic portal vein. The two veins that make hepatic portal vein will be splenic vein and then superior mesenteric vein. So hepatic or splenic vein and superior mesenteric vein make hepatic portal vein. And then inferior mesenteric vein is actually going to go into the splenic vein right over here. Then that blood will go to the liver. So remember, all that blood from the intestines, the stuff that you digested, the stuff that you absorbed, it has to go through the liver first. Then it will go back out or go back out into the body. So to get to the body, well, actually, sir, sorry, first of all, you can actually organize these in a certain way called the chair, which has your back of the chair, which is the hepatic portal vein, the seat of the chair, which is the splenic vein, front legs, the inferior mesenteric vein, and then the back legs, the superior mesenteric vein. But to finish off, the liver does eventually bring the blood back to the inferior vena cava and make a big distinction between these two because Hepatic portal vein goes into the liver. Hepatic vein goes out of the liver. So hepatic portal vein goes into the liver. Hepatic vein goes out of the liver and then into the inferior vena cava. So I think with that said, that should be just about it. So I think that's it. So good luck with your studying. Thank you for listening and I'll see you all next time.